าดจ้าดีไหมไปความที่ไรใช่ไหมไปวันที่ลาบีกันไปวันที่วัดเลยวันนี้ลอยอีกอย่างหนึ่งอีกแบบหนึ่งจะทำได้ You know, it's a pleasure that children get to die. When we come face to face with you, all our theology is out there. All of our lives is out there. When we really come, it's really important for you to see you face to face. Father, it's so awesome to handle your presence. Only you know the desires of each heart that's under here. You know us from the time we were born up to our present time. All our hurts, all our joys, all our temptations. All our weaknesses, all our faults and failures, and all our successes, we cannot hide from your presence. We can only call to you as we are. Father, there are some things that human words can never impart. There are some true revelations that human language cannot communicate. If we have ten thousand times to say your prayer, we could never explore you in your fullness. If we have ten thousand minds to understand. The revelation we cannot fully comprehend here. Father, in your predestination and in your destiny in our lives, according to your books that you have written and your plan for this world, only you, O God, can reveal. Deep in the corridors of our heart and life, those things of God that I have not seen nor even heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things which are prepared for those who love Him. Only You know, Lord, the best way You know how, how to bring a revelation into our lives. And oh God, in this presence. That you bring forth tonight. There are some here, Lord, who need most of our miracles. We pray, God, in Your grace and Your mercy. Yes, tonight will be their night, Lord. Yes, tonight is a night for some of you to receive your miracles. Father God. It has come before me, and the truth that I am about to reveal to your people are too awesome for me now. So hide me behind your cross, Lord, that I may safely speak about thy presence in thy most holy place, which we enter, Lord, with fear and trembling, because we know you are an awesome God. Reveal yourself, Father. Open some of your eyes, Lord, you know, to see you and know you. Those whose hearts are ready to be open, open your eyes that they may see you. Open their hearts that they may know you. Open their ears that they may hear you. Open their eyes. That they may see, 
Let your spirit fall in this place tonight. Give wishes, revelation, and drop your gift for into our lives. In accordance to the energy of your spirit, we thank you for the time. In Jesus' name, and we promise God, in all that you do, we give you all the glory. All the worship, all the praise, in Jesus' name, Amen. Tonight, there are angels present that were not present in the other night. I see them and I know them. God tonight has sent in a sign, special, angelic being from His throne into our midst. So please be very reverent as we sit in his presence tonight. Because God wants to visit us and speak to our hearts and our lives tonight. We have spoken in this morning session. of the entrance into the outer court to the law of faith, the entrance into the holy place of the law of the spirit of life. And then the last veil that we are about to enter tonight is the veil into the most holy place which in this morning session we have shown forth from the book of Hebrews 9. the book of Hebrews 9 that the tabernacle of Moses which was designed and uh, the placement of the piece of furniture was with the brazen altar the level in the outer court the candlestick on the left side of the holy place the showbread on the right side the altar incense before the, the second veil and then the out of the covenant within the second rail. But based on Hebrews 9, we have shown that the altar of incense in the heavenly pattern which Moses saw up there belongs to the most holy place. The reason it was transferred into the holy place was because God has to do, uh, the priest had to do regular service on the altar of incense. And they could not enter the most holy place but once a year on the Day of Atonement. And for practical reasons, God had brought it out. But in heaven, it is inside. And so you would have a pattern of two pieces of furniture in the outer court, two pieces of furniture in the holy place, and two pieces of furniture in the most holy place. We have shown this morning that the Two pieces of furniture on the outside, which is the brazen altar and the lever, which represents the power of the blood, the power of the word, represents faith and conscience, which must operate together in the law of faith. And we have shown that the candlestick and the table of showbread represent the other two forces that need to work together, which is the force of dunamis, represented by uh, the candlestick, and the force of exousia, authority, which uh, needs to work together and they both represent in the uh, table of showbread the power of the name in the candlestick the power of the Holy Spirit and these two operate in the middle section where resurrection power is vitally important to move into the second veil as you move into the second veil there are these two pieces of furniture the altar incense and the ark of the covenant and the ark of the covenant and the altar incense represents Urine and tuning, which in the Old Testament the words mean light and perfection. Now there's a whole teaching about what this means. It means light and perfection. And these are the two inner forces in the depth of, of the most holy place. In the outer court it represents conception and uh, in, the, in the holy place resurrection and in the most holy place Ascension. The outer court also represents 
our body. The holy place represents our soul, and the most holy place represents our spirit. So in a sense, we also have body, soul, and spirit. And God works with us in spirit, soul, and body. And uh, as we approach God, Romans 12 tells us, present your body as a living sacrifice, that your mind may be renewed or transformed. And that's how we enter into the will of God. And uh, so, those are the forces that are working. Tonight, we want to look especially at the third area here. And we remember, we also touch on the key Greek word for each law of the supernatural. In the law of faith, the key word is endunamo, which means an inhuman on the inside. It's a play on the word dunamis, which is a noun. The word form is dunamo. And adding a word en, or epsilon nu, which means in, in, in us. Something that works from within, and do not know. The second law of the study of life, the key Greek word, as we say, is elitu ro. And elitu ro means liberty of freedom. And in uh, Second Corinthians 3, we show how it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Into the second veil, there is a third keyword. And the third law is called the law of righteousness. The law of righteousness. Now, it looks so simple, righteousness. But he's not talking about the righteousness of man. He's not talking about the righteousness of like, the way we use it in English, uh, of a person fulfilling the demands and requirements of the law. He's not talking about the works of righteousness. He's talking about the righteousness that is a substance and an impartation from God. The gift of righteousness. So the law of righteousness works according to one key Greek word. All these laws, as we we'll say, are found in the book of Romans. And the law of righteousness, the key word is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which is the word mata mofumai, which is translated as transform. Now, how does the law of righteousness relate to transformation? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <laughs> Praise God. Let's just wake you up. Then when the presence of God came into the room and started praying, and uh, I mean, there are different levels of energizing and presence. I know it when it's at certain level, when it's at this level that God wants to manifest tonight. Uh, it, it, uh, I told Pastor William, uh, I don't dare to minister at that level because if I go in, I don't know how to come out. And uh, he, he turned to me and said, if you don't know how to come out, how do we come out? <laughs> I don't know, we'll figure out tonight. Right? Somewhere along the way, we'll figure out tonight. Right? And uh, so we, we, we'll just share the word first. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. It says here, In uh, verse 6 onwards, let me read verse 6 onwards. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the latter, but of the spirit, for the latter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, now he's talking about glory. They are talking about entering the Shekinah glory of God. In the ministry of the law, which is in Moses' time, and remember Moses saw the glory of God. When he saw the glory of God, it was glorious. He said, a Paul says, it was so glorious so that the children of Israel, in verse 7, could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of the glory in of his countenance, which glory was passing away. 
how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? He goes on in verse 9, for if the ministry of condemnation, now the ministry of condemnation is talking about the, the law, had glory, the ministry of righteousness, now in other words, it's the law of righteousness is talking about, a higher level than what we assume. The ministry of the spirit is called the ministry of righteousness. Exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious, and no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels, the glory that is coming will excel even what Moses had experienced. Now this righteousness is the gift of God which in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 it tells us that Jesus was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of Christ. So that we literally become the righteousness of Christ fully imputed upon our lives. This righteousness is a living substance not just uh, a record of good deeds or works. We are talking about spiritual substance of righteousness. Then we need to um, the book of Revelation. Let's look over the book of Revelation and consider some aspects of righteousness. In the passage that we are looking for is in uh, chapter 17, verse 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. 19, that's right, you're looking at the beast. 19, verse 8. Wondering what the beast was doing there. Hallelujah. We're going to take authority over the beast. Now, 19, verse 8. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. And this is not the earthly linen. It is a fruit. It has been a seed. Where did that seed come from? Not from our own work, but from the seed of righteousness that was earlier deposited. And by now, it has grown in our lives. And it has borne fruit. Remember that in Ephesians chapter 2, scriptures are we, we, well acquainted with, we are not saved by works, but we are saved by grace, and then not ourselves, but it is the gift of God. We are saved by grace through faith, and then not ourselves, but it's Ephesians 2 verse 8, but by the gift, it is the gift of God. If you read on in verse 9, verse 10, it tells us in Ephesians that we were saved and created for good works. Notice the contrast. We were saved not by works. We were saved by His grace, which is the gift of God. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, eight, uh, verse 9 and 10, it says we were created for good works. See, those works are not our works, but it's the gift of God, the energizing of God, as we've been talking about, that flow out from our lives as we obey God. Him who energizes to will and to do. So he makes us willing, so he's energizing, and then he helps us to do it, and we receive all the glory. Because it's from him, through him, by him, and to him, that all things are done. So this righteousness is a substance that you could wear in heaven, tremendous, as a linen. In fact, the clothing in heaven it's not necessarily made from plants or heavenly plants or material. The things and the material in heaven are made from actual virtues and truths. Remarkable. Things that we could never fully comprehend. And the crown that we will receive, and one of those crowns that is possible for us to receive if you read your scriptures is the crown of righteousness. 
And you notice how righteousness is tied up to glory, the shining brightness. And the righteous shall shine as the stars. And towards the end of the book of Revelation, it tells us, let the righteous be righteous. It's, it's talking about this shining glory that is the gift of righteousness that God imparts on His people. Let's turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And now, uh, <clears throat> this is wonderful, Lord. And we read on from there. For well, in verse 9, the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For well, even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excelled. For if what is passing was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses to put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were hardened, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, and that's the same word, Mata Mokumai, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This morning we touched on verse 17, which was where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is a liberty rule, which is liberty. Notice you are now moving from liberty into something else deeper, from the law of the Spirit of life, which is in itself very powerful. Yet from that land, we are moving deeper into the most holy place, which is in verse 18. Mata Mokumai, a transformation into that glory. Now the word Mata Mokumai is the same word that is used when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew chapter 17, it tells us that as, as Jesus was on the mountain, that he was transfigured. Our English word translation, they keep using different words for the same Greek word. The word transfigure in Matthew chapter 17, if you have your Bible in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, and was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Oh, that is glorious. If there's one thing that we all should desire, is that we will live our lives in such obedience and yieldedness to the Spirit of God and to Jesus Christ, that when we all get to heaven, we will be shining as bright as God allows us to shine. We should desire that. And the, the more closer you live with God while on this earth, when we are in heaven, we will shine brighter. If you live your life in the perfect will of God, doing all that God wants you to do, you will receive your reward in heaven. And also you will shine brighter. Which is why those who live closer to God have to live in a realm. There are different planes and different realms. But the glory that they begin to walk in even those who enter heaven at the deathbed experience cannot stand. And in visions of heaven, the Sadhu Sunda Singh went to heaven and he has a book out called The Spiritual World. He says there are these different planes in heaven 
and you are allowed to visit different planes. But when those on the lower plane visit the higher plane, they are given special clothing so that they can stand that glory. Imagine, there are saints living in the highest glory that is so bright that the saints in the lower rank could not stand. And when the saints in the highest rank enter the lower rank, they also have to put on special clothing so that the saints in the lower rank will not be bedazzled and overcome by the presence of that light on their lives. Oh, it should cause us to want to draw as near to God as possible. I believe it's the goal of every minister that you walk as close to God as you know how. It should be our goal. It was Paul's ultimate goal that he may know Him. That he may know God. It is my personal desire that I could walk with God until I'm translated. My desire is just to walk with God. If God tells me not to go anywhere to preach or minister, I would leave, I would be contented to live my, my life in a very quiet place in the country far away and just spend time in the presence of God. I love the presence of God. So the word here in Matthew 17 is the word transfigured. And we know from Peter's epistle that he referred to the glory of the kingdom of this incident here when he saw the glory that was on Jesus. That, that was the one thing that convicted him of the glory of the kingdom to come. He didn't understand on the day he experienced it and he saw it, but later on the spirit brought it to his mind. The same words are used in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, which you don't have to turn to, but in Luke chapter 9, there is a different word used, there is an expression or description of what Mata, mo, uh, metamorphumai means. Of course, many people try to point to it as meaning in a natural metamorphosis of how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. But it's more than that. And I think the best definition is given by Luke chapter 9. In the writings of Luke. What is the essence of the meaning of metamorphosis? It is not just a metamorphosis from a lava or a caterpillar into something else. Uh, here in chapter 9 of the writings of Luke. What is the essence of the meaning of metamorphosis? It is not just a metamorphosis from a lava or a caterpillar into something else. But here in chapter 9 of the Gospel of Luke, we are told in verse 28 and 29, And it came to pass about eight days after these things that he took Peter, John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. And his robe became white and glistening. The word altered is from a very interesting combination of Greek words. It's the word genomai heteros. Genomai is a simple word that means to become. The word beget is from the root word genomai, which means become, I become. The word heteros means something of a different kind. We, we mentioned that in, in this series. When we look at 1 Corinthians 12, we, we observe that the word heteros occurs in the gift. Now here it's not becoming another of the same kind. The face of Jesus, the being of Jesus in the presence of God did not become Ginomai Alos. It became Hetero, a man who was walking in the flesh, who ate the same food they ate 
who wore natural clothes like they did, was no ordinary man. He was a man who had God on his inside. And on that day, just for a moment of time, the glory of Jesus was revealed so deadly that the disciples didn't know what to do. It was God in the flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. How divine it is. He is not of this world. He took on the form of human flesh. Which is why the Bible calls him the last Adam, the second man. It was the last manifestation. And the same passage in 2 Corinthians 5 that tells us in verse 21 that Jesus became sin that we might become the righteousness of God is the same passage that in verse 17 tells us those who are in Christ are a new species, a new creation. The Greek word is a new species in God. I want you to know that God is doing a tremendous work, O oh church. If we know and we could see truly the glorious church from the way God sees it. On our inside is the seed of God. First John chapter 3. And what is on our inside now? Although we look at our minds and we look at our physical body and we see this clay vessel. We could hardly believe the glory that is to come. I want you to know that on our inside, the spirit man that is born again does not belong to this earth. It is so powerful and glorious that when one day we are all caught up with God and Jesus comes again, and when everything of His plans have been completed on this earth, He has to make a new heaven and a new earth in order to contain the glorious redeemed thing. This earth is not able to contain the manifestation of the Son of God, which Romans 8 speaks about. This is God's desire in our life. It is my heteros. Now, the question in our mind is to what extent is that going to take place in our life? It depends, my friend, on two things. The amount of metamorphomize taking place in our soul and taking place in our physical body. Our spirit does not need any more metamorphosis. It's born in the image of God. But our minds and our bodies need. Enoch walked with God for 300 odd years. And he was not. Because one day, you see, when you spend time in God's presence, and you're in His presence, and in the most holy place, it's so holy, we have a lot of patterns in the Old Testament. Even in the shadow form, I'm talking just about the shadow form of the Shekinah glory, which is in Moses' time. When Aaron's two sons died, Nadab and Abihu died, God says, you are not allowed to cry, to weep, or to have a funeral service because the anointing oil is on you. Think about that. 
That's how holy that shadow is. How much more when we talk about that most holy place of Almighty God, the real pattern which Moses saw before he built the tabernacle. That holiness, the glory that is there. And there are people like Enoch who are with God so much that one day their mind started going into metamorphosis. It becomes genoma heteros. And one day that physical body became genoma heteros. It became another different type of body. And he was gone. Oh glory, glorious Lord. How we thirst for your glory. How does that take place? What actually occurs? Let me point to a truth here in Second Corinthians chapter 3. Notice here in verse 14, But their minds were hardened, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. And then in verse 18, compare it. We all with unveiled faith. The context for interpreting the veil is that the veil here equals the mind. And in this context, the unrenewed mind. It was a veil for them that they could not see God. Which is why when you deal with Mata Mofumai in Romans 12 verse 2 it says be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Something must take place in our mind. Remember, we have said that the outer court represents your body, the holy place, your soul, which includes your emotions, your will, and your mind, and your spirit man, which represents the most holy place. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, the second veil, which was the one that separates the most holy place from the holy place, was torn apart in the temple. It was not the veil between the outer court and the holy place. Now what is the reason? Because now when Jesus Christ rises from the dead having died on the cross buried in a tomb, placed in a tomb, descended into Hades, rose up in three days and he ascended high. There must be a difference that takes place in the mind and in the spirit of man. One day when he comes again, the other veil will be torn that separate the outer court from the holy place. That's the veil which separates our flesh from the spirit realm directly. What does that mean? That means now the soul area can receive the glory of God coming in and the soul can come and be transformed. Our souls can be renewed, transformed by the light of God that shines forth. See this veil thing is all in symbolic form. 
in the book of second corinthians chapter 5 verse 16 therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh even though we have known christ according to the flesh yet now we know him thus no more in the book of hebrews it talks about the veil of christ's flesh that was crucified for us see it's symbolic when jesus comes again the outer court and the holy place which is our body and soul will that that the barrier will be broken why we will receive a new body a new body that is capable of handling that glory and there will be no more veil between our physical body and the spirit world our body will be a spiritual body that is tangible and yet spiritual but until he comes again that veil is still in place but the other veil is open and I want to talk about the other veil which is most important for it's already open it's already torn apart so that the metamorphosis of the mind of the things of God can begin to take place never before in the manifestations of God in man except in the new covenant period has there been such an emphasis to the writings of the apostle Paul about the mind of Christ and the renewal of our mind and our mind is likened unto the mind of Christ here in the Old Testament uh, in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians Let's look at the book of Ephesians and we look at verse 17 onwards, chapter 1 That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him The eyes of your understanding, and that's the word dianoia being enlightened, filled with light that you may know what is the hope of his calling in fact the word enlighten in the Greek literally means flooded with light that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in a thing and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us to believe according to the working of his mighty power which is working Christ and we talk about the presence that God had in our life and it's connected to the resurrection power of God now this is the connection that we are making here we have always thought that the glory of God is just some sort of presence and some sort of shining light that comes in different measures upon our life and we are transformed as we see him examine the Hebrew word and the Greek word for the word presence the word presence in the Hebrew the main Hebrew word for the word presence is the word panin p-a-n-i-n which literally means face or countenance See, we are so used to our English definition present can mean uh, anything it doesn't mean a person's face it can mean just uh, uh, some thoughts about the person or some evidence that the person has been there that's all but the Hebrew word for present means face of countenance it means seeing face to face 
not just an, a token, a reminder of the person's existence. That, you can call it glory. Is it presence and glory are two different Hebrew words. The word glory is the word kabod in Hebrew. But presence is countenance, faith. It is not just degrees of those glory. Glory is the resultant light from that presence. The presence is a face-to-face encounter with God. Even if you examine it in the Greek, there are two main Greek words for presence. And uh, one is the word prosopon. The other word is the word anopion. A third one, which is used in Jude verse 24, is the word kate nopion, which is from the word, same word nopion. Means faith or countenance. And the word glory in the Greek is also from a different word. The word glory we know is doxa in the Greek. It's not the same word as presence. We are not just talking about the glory of God. Now, the glory of God came on the whole tabernacle. The glory of God came in Exodus 40. The glory of God came in 2 Chronicles 5. The glory of God came. But we are talking about the presence of God. We are talking about Seeing God face to face. That's why it's so sacred tonight. I'm not just talking about ministerial anointing. I'm not just talking about the glory of God that we move and operate in. We're talking about God himself. And seeing God. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God oh I have wrestled with that verse from my early Christian life the beatitude 95 Jesus said blessed are the pure in heart oh how I wanted to see God and know God and as I grew in my Christian life I began to understand God there's one thing that I've discovered. It may not be God's will for everybody to have discerning of spirit or the gifts of the spirit operating in visions or dreams, in open visions or closed visions. But it is the will of God that all His people can behold His presence. And I want to share with you the secret of how to do that tonight. The secret thing. It all has to do with metamorphomai, the real life. For in many of our hearts we are like the Old Testament scene that Paul described in 2 Chronicles, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, even though we actually belong to the New Testament period. Our minds are unrenewed. Our minds are unenlightened. And so we cannot see and know God. And then God began to show that if God's people will allow metamorphomai to take place in their mind, then they will see His glory. They will see Him face to face. And this morning I said the truth that I discovered in God, which I'm tying it all together. If you want to receive God's glory and God's anointing and presence and His Holy Spirit coming, He can 
come, bring it down to you on this planet Earth. But if you want to have God's presence, where is God today? He's not there. You must go up. Now, many times we equate presence with glory, and that's understandable because glory is the result of His presence to a different degree. But if we want panim, prosopon, enopion, katinopion, His face, His countenance, Brethren, we must go up. But you said, Lord, I'm down here in the flesh. I'm not raptured yet. Who said you have to be raptured yet? Ephesians chapter 2. It says here in Ephesians 2. Words four onwards, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loves us, I want you to know it's because of his love. Why did he save us? That we may be with him. Is love in our life. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive. That is law number one. He put something into us together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 6. And raise us up together. That's law number 2. Resurrection power. See, we can only understand this truth in depth with those three sessions we have gone through. He raised us up. That's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and made us sit together with him in heavenly places that's law number three the law of righteousness now we are talking about sitting in his presence sitting in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus it is our spirit that us can ascend in Christ Jesus. You see, there are some truths about the spirit that we don't have time to, to study through. But just me, let me just show some scriptures on the spirit man. In Colossians, send to the book of Colossians, Chapter 3, chapter 2, that's right, verse 5. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now what's Paul speaking about here? He says, I am absent in the flesh, Yet my spirit is with you beholding your order. There are five qualities of the spirit man. I don't have time to touch on that, I just give it to you in point form. Number one, it can transcend distances geographically. Your body can be here, but your spirit can be taken by God to another place. Ezekiel's spirit was taken from, from the area in Babylon where he was in exile to Jerusalem where he saw the sin of the Israelites. Number two, our spirits are not limited in time. It can move into the future, it can move into the past. 
Number three, our spirits are not limited to natural or intellectual knowledge. Our spirit will know more things than our mind know, although our mind takes time to understand what the spirit receives. Number four, our spirit will have the rhythm in heaven, which is number four. Our spirit will have the rhythm in heaven, which is a heavenly music in our lives. If we can chapter five, and we constantly in heaven, everything is playing in the rhythm musically. Number five, our spirit has such power. And we never realize that it's in there. Now, most people truly do not understand. It means that your body can be healed, but your spirit can be understood in heaven. Not as so suddenly like what some people say. Nobody will understand any quality of our spirit, man. I'm not talking about the an uh, anointing of Jesus still operating in you where you're cut up or, or in some way when you know you you love the body. But I'm talking about something that is a development of your future, what we got to match up most to mind. As you know, it's future through the comparison. There are some things that take place in the anointing of all crown. The all the power and you you consciously are taken into heaven. But there is a line, and I'm talking about the line. So that is a, a very important line because that becomes a part of your life. That is where the supernatural body becomes naturalized. In the other part, what happens is your natural does not even come upon you, and then suddenly you become supernatural. But what God wants us is that we will walk through in this law of the spirit so that what is supernatural becomes naturalized. Although our consciousness can be here, yet at the same time, remember the way it's not your body is uh, blocking your body and uh, your uh, from your mind, it's not the way that it opens your mind and your spirit realm. So your mind that is really combined with your spirit realm and the consciousness is taken into the realm of the spirit. And you are in the realm of faith to faith with God. Oh, hallelujah. That's why God put us in a heavenly place. We don't have him on the heart in Testament. He wants to show himself. He doesn't want to love him without his spirit and knowing him. Why don't you raise us up to see the heavenly place? That we may see him face to face. In the old testament, the heaven and the sun has been. It says the time of God was in the body. You know what that means? God was in the body. They couldn't make it. But they wanted The faith in the countenance of God. Beholding it in. This has been the design of God since my time to say. And the fact is that there are many who do not know how to see God through Christian. And as it still keeps me the glory and the presence of God. And if you think that this is only something that is he said, it's it. When he talked from the John chapter 17, when he gave it to him, John 17, verse 24, he was praying, Father, John 17, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also who live with me, may be with me where I am. That they may be whole, my glory, which you have given me. For they are not seen before the foundation of the world. Your master, our Savior, 
our Lord Jesus Christ. Wonder us to be people in the heavenly kingdom. We can do that in the spirit to be no one to enter in. By letting God to move through my sickness in our mind. We can enter into the most holy thing and see him face to face. This was the cry of the Father heart of God. This was the cry of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he would bring us to be seated in the heavenly place. And they say this is true saying, Jesus Christ. Excuse me, Lord Jesus. You read the time of the Greek in a different school. It's in a past time. And anything that is past time, that we see in Christ becomes a promise for our present experience. Not a promise of our future experience. It didn't say we shall be raised up to see the heavenly place. He says we have. In Christ, we are supposed to ascend. The sad part is that not many are in him. We are of him, but we are not walking in him. He is the escalator and the elevator path into the heavenly path. In him. Look at creation chapter 3. And you still say it. That this belongs to me to the last time. It's up to you. And for me and my household, we want to follow God. To walk after Him. All that He has promised us, we want. That is possible in this life, we want. And nothing else. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 1. It's more Peter than something. Now, there will be a future tense that has to do with our physical body. Understand? Our physical body will one day be caught up. It's called the consequence of sin. But now, your spirit, only your soul, can be caught up into the world. In this presence. If you die in Colossians 3 verse 1, you will live with Christ. Think those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Let's see. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Now, listen here. Where is Christ? Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Look at what it is. For you die and your life is hidden with Christ. And when you read the word with Christ, is talking about in the heavenly place. If you didn't live Christ, in the heart, oh, in the heavenly place. And you must learn, my friend, to understand. We have been made alive. We have been raised resurrection power, and we walk in the resurrection power. We need to learn how to understand in the land, and live in the land. From time to time, we need to come back down in order to fulfill our earthly responsibilities. 
to do whatever is necessary as a part of the discipline of this life. But then we quickly run into his presence and our son and remember. We become like angels of God. He lives in that setting who, when Gabriel appeared to Mary, he says, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And they're always in that presence of God. And when there's a doubt and a what to do, they be standing and they carry out God's mission and command. And then they come back and they stand in the presence of God. Your spirit and your soul is supposed to sit. Stand, remain in the presence of God. And when there are something to do with in this life we have, there are family responsibilities, there are professional work that is a part of your life to take care of your physical body. And there are responsibilities that you have to be faithful to. You come down and you fulfill them, you do everything, but you get back and you remain. Basic faith in the presence of God. The sad thing is that many, when they touch this land, they come down and they never go back again. They're lost in the jungle somewhere of early life. Some are so stuck in the jungle that they cannot come out. And they never learn how to explain. I'm not talking about our physical bodies which still walk on this earth. Sometimes by the power of the spirit, the physical body can be transported for a short time out. But it's your spirit and your soul. Now our spirit can stand in the view of easy, but then a spirit and a soul need to be together for the understanding to take place. And sometimes some of our souls are filled with all kinds of death. So when the spirit has to ascend, it could not ugly away from the sun. Filling out the rocket ship with granite and everything that is unnecessary. And you can't ascend because your mind hasn't gone to metamorphose too much. I'm presenting to you something very deep. Something very precious and sacred. If you would not hold of this truth, you would learn the secret that Enoch walked in, that Elijah walked in, that Jesus walked in, that the Apostle Paul walked in of that section. Some people enter into it only for such time to never get back. Some people have a glimpse of it and never enter. But there are those more and more in this last day that God calls you to enter even into the divine of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's when we are with Him that His blessings and glory come down even to the physical body. Draw nigh to God and God draws nigh to you. So there is a uh, Reflection of the glory in the book of Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. Where seven being written, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. For we all with unveil faith. Your unveil faith is a revealed mind. Combining Dalinonia, which is a visual part, the metamorphic mind. So I will say, beholding a hidden mirror, the glory of the Lord, I've been transformed with a same image from glory to glory. This is by the Spirit of the Lord. So as you enter into the ascension, there is a reflection back of transformation. And the more you ascend, the more transcendent there is a divine unity in God. In chapter 4, you can go in there. Verse 6. So, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory 
องย่อคือมันต้นสวนพลยังรับไปคือมันต้นของชีวิตเราตอนนี้ที่ว่าการติดต่อดีดีดูสิถ้าจะหาวันที่ยากคนเดียวหัวใจเต็มเต็มจะพูดมาเอาเรื่องสู้เอาเรื่องเรื่องสู้ยากคนละเอ็นสู้ There is no artist on this planet Earth, no joy of Jesus that will be sufficient. We cannot get help from the natural. We are talking about natural joy of painting. It doesn't work. It has to be on the inside of our heart by the pain of the Holy Ghost. As you allow God to make a walk through my in your soul. And as you see the glory of God, the reverse takes place. Look at the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 5. But being full of the Holy Ghost, going into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. So he said, look, I see the heaven open and the sun of my standing and the right hand of God. Now, that is what he received at the highest level of his open vision. But I believe that even before that, Stephen has some form of metamorphosis through my taking place. He said, in a heavenly place, in his spirit, whatever things happen around me, doesn't affect me because he was a bright person. And a glory already started in his life in, in the book of Acts chapter 6. Then they put him before the same heathen council, and all men of things were spoken in verse 16. And all were set in the council, Looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. We can know God. We can be with God in it in our soul. When God began to show this truth about entering and being present and being with him. Oh, the preciousness of it. It's not just a theology, it's an experience in God. Theology is important. Theology tells you what the true experiences are that you need to seek. Without theology, you get into higher faith. Because you know that theologically, Jesus died in the cross for you, you accept him and experience him. Because you believe theologically that the Spirit can empower you and heal you and, and get baptized in the Spirit, you accept the true first, then you seek the experience and you receive it. Some of us, because of our simple mindedness or, or simple heart, we receive it even before we fully understand it because of the openness of our heart. And I want you to know why in the city, there are not many notable miracles as much as in the villages. It's because through our intellectual training and through the, the kind of education system that we are being, being brought up with, we are taught to doubt. We are taught in unbelief. And there are so many questions and doubts that arise in our mind up here when God wants to do something that we cannot work because we doubt. Yet, if we will only lay aside those things, now our mind can be useful for God, but it must believe first before it understands. It doesn't, you cannot understand before you believe. It is, but how can I believe if I don't understand? Based on whether it's God's word. If God says it, accept it at face value. 
There are many things that are so clear cut, you see. You know, in my name, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But people question whether the scripture is part of God's word. They question whether that is true. They question many things. But the simple folks in the tribal areas, if they only have that one scripture, and mind you, if you have tried every natural thing, you know how, and there's no other way you will get that scripture. It's because in our modern society, we've got so many alternatives. If God doesn't work, I've got this other thing. Back up. So we doubt. We need the unbelief. There's too much unbelief in the Church of Jesus Christ, which is one of your notable miracles, signs and wonders. There's, there's too much doubting. And even when God does something after that, we doubt. And the Holy Spirit is grieved and finds it hard to work in our lives. But oh, how God longs for a renewed people who will have their hearts and their minds renewed in God. That they will be able to see the Word, understand the Word, and accept what God says without God. And when we could enter into that land and see that person, there will be a degree of glory and light of time who will never, never realize this thing. What? It was in the heavenly place. And God began to show me this. This thing about the heavenly place. You see, all, I, 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 I desire, in one of my prayers, that, that uh, God would give me a visit to heaven. But not be in an interesting way. Not the way I expect it. And the reason he does it that way is he says so that I could go back as often as I wanted to stay in his presence. And he began to reveal this truth about attention and sitting with him and experiencing him and letting the mind just focus on Jesus. And that all that is in your mind is the world of Jesus and it's testing with you. And you enter. Sometimes some of us, when we are in a certain state of worship, we, our mind is at the right level of natural muscle life and you enter in. Which is why sometimes it takes to worship some time in order to bring many people into the supernatural realm. But my friends, you could leave there. And when God began to let me experience that moment, it was awesome. At first, when I entered into God's heavenly place and the land where His glory and His throne is, it's so awesome that all I did was fall on my knees. I, 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 could, I, I could feel my spirit man. I could see my spirit man falling before the throne of God, and I could not lift my head up for the head for a long, long time. I tried a few moments, but could not. I, I was just down and then looked and crying before the throne of God, because His presence is awesome. And God was showing me a way to remain in that presence. So this proof that I'm sharing with you, and and now then, God wanted to just, to, to just remain there, to stay before God. And just let His presence see you. And then Jesus came and said, Come, come and sit on my throne. I tell you, I don't know what it feels like. I mean, I dare not. I dare not. Something about its holiness. I know it's in the scripture we speak with God in heavenly place, but when, 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 you, when you when you see God face to face with His throne, you dare not. You are going to bow down before Him for eternity because He is God. He is an awesome God. Now all these things took place the day God will do this thing to me, and I. I learned how to enter in that way. And finally, 
They don't know what it is in experience. They don't know what it looks like. And, and I realize that when you have experienced that and you come down and you walk on this earth, no wonder when Jesus said something and you say, like, please be still, he doesn't have to repeat it, because of the illusion, that kingly mess that is in his life, that is still operating when he's on this earth. And when we begin to understand that, we begin to walk more into that realm. And uh, after the experience of what it's like, there are many things that are taking place in the throne at the throne of God. See, the throne of God is not static. It's not just like a, a whole lot of light that we, we, we cannot fully uh, uh, understand or not just a whole place full of light. No. A lot of things take place on the throne. And I'll be amazed by the many things that it is never, never repeated. There's a lot of activity that takes place. And uh, every time the people sing or worship or praise God, in many times when, when we are worshiping God, even in these meetings, my spirit is up there, just on the throne, a secret that I've learned how to ascend with my spirit and soul into the throne of God. When we sing, for example, when we sing that God is a warrior, there is a different manifestation of God glory. A, a kind of war begins to flow from the throne. When we begin to sing about God of love, there is a kind of love that begins to emanate from the throne. It, it's dazzling. It, it's things that I, I, I never realized such activity was going on. I mean, you thought that the throne room was that, there's just a light keep flowing up. And for the first time, I realized that what we sing and what we say about God is what we receive from Him. Literally. When we say that God is the provider, that's the same force that begins to emanate from the throne. That glory of God is the provider. When we begin to say that God is King, that same glory of the King begins to manifest. When we say that God is the Father, that thing, there's so many shades of glory, that thing, the glory of God is the Father begins to animate. We get what we say and confess of our God. When they confess that He is the God, the mighty God, who, who could win a victory, God's power begins to flow from that throne. Oh, it's such glorious things that are true. I can only share some of the things. And things that still sometimes puzzle my mind that I still cannot understand. So time I will. And there are other reflections on, on the things that take place on the throne. Is that the power that emanates from God gets transmitted into the angels. And this is the feeling of what it's like. You see, God is the light of the universe and of his creation. So you can imagine what it's like to come face to face with the force of light. And we know that all of this, like the moon, reflects the glory of the physical sun, we reflect the glory of Almighty God. And this is an amazing thing that I realized when I was at the throne room. That all our shining brightness came from the throne. By all, I mean even the shining garment. The moment, I mean it never happened, but it, I, I, I mean the realization of that. But if God were to for one moment shut down the light 
and prevent it from standing from the throne. Every bright garment that the angels wear. And you know the angels can come in different degrees. Even in the book of Revelation, there was one powerful angel that came down who had a rainbow above his head. We know the angels are different brightness and the people of God who walk with God are different brightness. But the moment God would close down that light that comes from his throne and prevent it from shining forth, every angel and every human being and every garment and every linen and every thing and even the works of righteousness and the things are wearing and some of them are wearing, every one of them will turn black. Or oh, the realization that all light comes from God. Without Him, there is no light and no light. Awesome. And I began to realize that God is not end. And whatever light we receive is a portion of His mercy and grace. That is why in heaven, even the brightest angel, the shiniest singing closer to God, will not be able to bow. Because even that light and brightness came from the God of light. And we all will only glorify Him. One of the most marvelous things about spending time in the presence of God is that God gives me a small glimpse into what my work in heaven will be like. I knew what my work is here on earth. I know I was overjoyed. I was overjoyed. I mean, to discover our early calling is enough. But just being in his presence, and he shared some secret things of what we will be in heaven. And particularly, he showed me something of my destiny even in heaven. We know in heaven we live 10,000 times, 10,000 years. This early life. At the moment, it's possibly 120. We take care of it and we walk with God. But a heavenly mission and vision is far glorious. And just to give you a glimpse of that truth, everything that you do for God on this earth is a sweet form of what you will ultimately be doing in heaven. Plus, there are many seeds in your life that you could not fulfill on this earth. And the fulfillment is in heaven. And there are a lot of things there in the glories of God in heaven. And I see angels come and go from the throne. From time to time, there are different angels that are released from the throne. And one thing that I discovered, angels change their clothes. It's amazing to me. I mean, they don't actually change in the same way we go to a singing room. They enter into the presence of God and receive a new garment, and this is interesting. Every time the angels of God has a different job to do, a different work to do, they take upon themselves different types of garments. The garments there, is it for us on this earth, we pattern sometimes clothing according to the job. There are certain jobs that require different type of uniform and work. The larger pattern is up there, except that many times the job uniform that we have here is not comfortable and we always like to go for informal clothing. But in heaven, it's both comfortable and, and yet it, it started the job but more than that, that garment also is an impartation of the anointing and the power required to fulfill the job. The, uh, an impartation of dynamics as well as exclusive. For example, a policeman, if he's in, in uh, informal clothing, may not be recognized. If he doesn't carry his badge of authority around on his, 
authorization card, he may never be able to exercise his authority. But when he's in uniform, we respect that. And that uniform gives him exousia. In heaven, the uniform or the clothing gives us exousia and dunamis. Have you noticed that Jesus changed his clothes in different revelations? I mean, you see him in different types of clothing, uh, even in the Bible. And in the revelations, you find him especially wearing with a girdle around him, about his chest. All these are part of different special functions and jobs in heaven. All oh, the realm of heaven is divine. And tonight, we are able to enter into that realm. For some of us who are ready, if you open your heart and your life to God tonight, let's go to God in prayer. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, O oh Father, for your divine glory. There's none like you, O oh God. There's none before you. We thank you, Father. We worship you, Lord. We ask, Lord, tonight, may you have your purpose and your will in our life. Establish your purpose and your will in our life, Lord. That we may do all that you want us to do. You are holy. We worship the Holy God. Thank you, Lord, for fulfilling another one of the least of my requests, my desire. Lord, there are many here with many desires. They are unfulfilled. Spiritual desires, some natural desires. Only you know our hearts and our lives. Yeah. Set our hearts to God tonight in every divine way. Come, Lord Jesus, and show yourself to us tonight. For those who are ready to meet you face to face, guide us even now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's all rise and sing a song we are standing on holy ground. And as you sing, this is what I want you to do, to practice what you have been taught tonight. I want you to let go of all your natural things tie you down. And Romans 8 tells us that with our mind we must focus on the things of the spirit. It is not hard to enter into the realm of his soul and be put in the heavenly place. The hardness and the difficulty are inside, not outside. It's in your mind. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And if that was pure, with the help of the faith of each one, and the corporate anointing, it's easy for you to begin to experience that if you let yourself go tonight. Your worst enemies are doubt, fear, and unbelief. And all these exist in your mind. If you will let them go tonight, you will receive your miracle from God. For some of us who may have other desires and needs, if you let them go tonight, and I know my spirit, some of you are ready, He will show you His glory. I know for you who are ready, God may just take your spirit and soul into the rest of His presence. The Bible says we are seated in the heavenly place in Christ. When will you do it? When will you allow your soul and your spirit to us? 
How long must our Savior wait for you? You answer that right. Will he have to wait for another day, another month, another year? I want you to know it's a costly thing to enter the most holy place. Man was not allowed to enter in the history. And for nearly 4,000 years of Old Testament history, God required blood. And even that blood in shadow form was not enough. He only permitted them to enter the shadow of the most holy place once a year. It was so holy. So precious. To all humans, we think that when something is holy, that it's just sacred. It's just holy. But I want you to know what holy means to God. The word holy means sinless, purity, and something that, that, that you cannot approach easily. But I want you to know what holy is to God. Holy means precious to me. It is because there are some things that are precious to God that He reveal it to man as being holy. That is what we do with the things that are precious to us. If you have an earthly thing of value, a jewel, a ruby or whatever, if it's precious to you, do you show it to every stranger? No. Do you take care of it and guard over it? Yes. Because it's precious to you. Your children, your loved ones are precious to you. Will you allow any stranger to come and abuse them? No, because they are precious to you. Tonight, I want you to get a revelation of God. That holiness is not something that God put up so that He make it difficult for us to approach Him. For God, the definition of holiness is precious. It's because there are some things very precious and dear to His that he doesn't want us to take life. He didn't make it hard for us to approach him. He didn't purposely do it. It's because they're fresh. They're things that touch the core of his being. And I want you to know tonight, please, don't take it lightly. Jesus Christ had to pay for our entrance into the most holy place with his precious blood. And now when he has paid the price of his precious blood, so few, so few, to enter. We encourage so many times to enter into a throne of grace. But we don't fully know the preciousness. God doesn't want you to just enter for a visit. He wants you to enter and leave there. Oh, when he showed me that, you see, I thought that going, and somebody when I said about showing him, he thought that was a special visit. All I asked from God was a visit to heaven. But God answered my prayers beyond what I asked. And he showed me that he didn't want us to visit, he wants us to stay there. He has made us alive. Raise us from the dead together with Christ. To 
You're going to sit in heaven eternally. Forever. Jesus says that they, all that they may, they may be with me where I am. Will you let go of your doubts and unbelief, of your sin, of all your earthly pride, and take the most precious thing in the universe, the blood of the Lamb, and enter the cross tonight? And in that presence, sickness melts away, hurt melts away, division melts away, God melts away. What need to know that denomination are not made by God. Neither are they made by the devil? Because the great denominations have won many souls to Jesus. But denominations are made by men. Men who found this motive are very pure most of the time. They organize the denominate in order to do a work. I want you to know it's not your sheep, it's not my sheep, it is his sheep. One day we will all come face to face with Jesus and we will understand. But even out of an imperfect situation, even out of whatever man has offered God, God will do a mighty thing. And that's hope for every denomination. Most important thing, no matter where you come from, what denomination you are, so what's the most important thing? The presence of God. Doesn't matter what label you wear, if you have the presence of God, that's what God wants. And the presence of God doesn't just rest on a physical place, it rests on human flesh to you be. Therefore, the most important thing in any denomination is a leader. And I want you to know we all need the presence of God. It's our desire that every denomination in every church be revived and renewed. And one day, if we all are open to the Spirit and we need to God, even each denomination will be able to be like a different jewel to God. Under every church has the presence of God, and each one reflecting a different area and type of glory. How beautiful it is when brethren dwell in unity. And we all recognize one another's strength and accept one another because Christ accepted it. Thank you, Father God, for worship. The presence of God is right now feeling this room in this place. And if we prepare our heart to sing that song, one thing that I want you, I want to do in obedience to the Spirit. Uh, those, those of you who have the inclination in order to flow along and obey God. When those of you who are pastors and leaders in your various churches, when you become, can you stand in a line here in the front. And I can understand it if 
you don't feel comfortable about coming because of different things in your background or your situation, you don't have to. You feel that you could come without any problem, you need to come. Just stand there and I'll grow in our line. Thank you. 